In the autumn of 1888, a series of brutal murders in the East End of London lit a flame that sent shockwaves reverberating around the civilized world and caused a scandal that struck right at the heart of the British establishment. London, in 1888, was the world's largest capital city. Queen Victoria sat upon the throne of England and ruled an empire that was ever expanding. She had recently celebrated 50 glorious years as monarch. Her subjects seemed confident, entrepreneurial and determined. The city of London, the financial boiler room that powered the empire and its expansion, reflected the supreme confidence of the age. Yet right on its doorstep lay the district of Whitechapel a sordid, crime-ridden quarter where vice, violence and drunkenness flourished and where 76,000 residents lived in abject poverty. The East End really was outcast London. Um, In 1883, when the chairman uh, for the London School Boards did a report, he reported that out of of 1,129 families, 871 of them were living in rooms just one room big and up to nine people per room. Whitechapel had the capital's worst slums, worst overcrowding and highest death rates. It was also the immigrant district and the 1880s had seen a huge influx of Jewish refugees fleeing persecution in Russia, Poland and Romania. Parts of Whitechapel had the appearance of a foreign town whose inhabitants, mostly lower class Jews, spoke their own language and dressed differently to the other citizens of the East End. There was a very large Jewish community in the East End. Uh, there had been um, a large, a, a huge immigration into the East End at, uh, in the in 1880s. The immigrants were, were living in a way that was different to the, to the Gentile population, and a lot of the Gentile population resented that not so much resented the fact that these people were Jewish, although there there was anti-Semitism. Inevitably, this led to a certain amount of racial tension as these immigrants were accused of taking English jobs and English homes. But whether they were Jew or Gentile, all those who lived in the area shared one thing in common. Life was a daily battle for survival. The area was terribly overcrowded. People lived crammed together in miserable circumstances, in absolutely dire poverty. All arches damp and dripping, and there was sort of um, straw on the floor, and lots of horse dropping, and all horses everywhere. The area was very, very grim, very poverty-stricken. There's no sanitation. There's just off the main highways and byways, you've got loads of alleyways and courts with people just throwing out their sewage and their rubbish. I mean, the stench must have been awful in the East End. For the poor and destitute, the main accommodation was offered by the common lodging houses. There were 233 of them in Whitechapel, and each night, eight and a half thousand men, women and children sought shelter within their decaying walls. Now, if you were in a common lodging house, because of course nobody could afford their own sort of flat or house, it would cost you eight pence for a double bed, um, four pence for a single one, and if you couldn't afford that, for tuppence, you could go to sleep standing up, lined up against a rope, stretched from one side of the room to the other, and hundreds of men, women and children did that every night in Whitechapel. For the women, there were few career opportunities, and those that were available paid a pittance, barely enough to cover the cost of a bed in a common lodging house, and certainly not enough to pay for food as well. So many of them turned to prostitution, not out of any real choice, but out of a necessity to survive. The Met actually sort of estimated that there were over 1,200 prostitutes of a very low class actually working in Whitechapel. On the surface, Victorian London may have seemed supremely confident and eminently respectable, but beneath that surface there lurked a general feeling of extreme unease. In the 1880s you had all these, these, these different fears and anxieties, and this kind of social fear really of, of things that were going on, the changes to the ordered society that the middle classes and the upper classes were, were so used to. 
And it was a, a period where a lot of people were frightened. There was a, there was a genuine fear of, that there was going to be a revolution. The East End came to be the focus for all of that anxiety, all of that social anxiety. Jack the Ripper came along at just the right time, in just the right place, and he frightened people in the same way as all these other fears were frightening people. And so Jack the Ripper, in many ways, became the embodiment, the physical embodiment of all of those anxieties. If the Ripper could step across the border from the poverty-stricken, immoral East End and infect the rest of London, then so could all of these other kind of nebulous fears spill across and make, bring about uh, an awful lot of, of social unrest and social change. But the fact is that, that it did penetrate the consciousness of the people in a way that an ordinary murderer hadn't done in the, in the past and would never do again. At around 3.40 a.m. on August 31st, 1888, a carter named Charles Cross was walking along Bucks Row here in Whitechapel when, in a gateway that used to stand here, he saw what he took to be a bundle lying on the ground. Thinking it was a tarpaulin that might prove useful, he went over to inspect it, but stopped in his tracks when he saw it was a woman lying there. Moments later, he heard footsteps behind him and turning, saw another carter, Robert Paul, approaching. Nervously, the two men approached the silent form and stooped down over the body. Charles Cross felt the woman's hands. They were quite cold. Robert Paul, meanwhile, was leaning over, trying to see if he could detect any sign of breath. He couldn't. But when he touched the chest, he fancied it moved slightly. I think she's breathing, he told his companion, but very little if she is. Paul wanted to sit the woman up, but Charles Cross didn't want to touch the body any further. So they thought they'd wasted enough time at the scene, so they pulled her skirts down to cover her decency and went on their way, agreeing to tell the first policeman they met of their find. But what neither man had noticed in the darkness was that the woman's throat had been cut so savagely that her head had almost been severed from her body. That discovery was made by PC John Neal as he walked his beat along Bucks Row shortly after Cross and Paul had left the scene. It was he who raised the alarm and sent for local medic Dr. Cluellen, who having carried out a cursory examination of the body, gave orders for its removal to the mortuary. Here, the night held a further shock, for when Inspector Spratling arrived to take down a description of the deceased, he discovered something that had so far eluded everyone. Beneath her bloodstained clothing, a deep gash ran along her abdomen. She had been disemboweled. Jack the Ripper's reign of terror had begun. The woman's name was Mary, or Polly, and Nichols, a 43-year-old prostitute who had earlier been ejected from a nearby lodging house because she didn't have the fourpence to pay for a bed. I'll soon get my DOS money, she had confidently predicted. See what a jolly bonnet I've got. That bonnet now lay trampled in a white chapel gutter. Polly had her throat cut from left to right, right back to the spinal column. Um, she had several incisions on her body. She was ripped up to the breastbone, but no organs were removed that we know of from Polly. Since the murder had taken place on the eastern fringe of Whitechapel, responsibility for its investigation fell to the officers of the Metropolitan Police's J Division. However, there had already been two previous murders that year in the very heart of Whitechapel, and they were being investigated by detectives of H Division, headed by Inspector Edmund Reed. Officially, there were only five Jack the Ripper victims, although there were two other murders that happened before that of Polly Nichols, which most history books considered the first Jack the Ripper murder. Um, the murders of Emma Elizabeth Smith in April 1888 and that of Martha Tabram or Turner in August 1888 are considered by some people to have been the early sort of works of Jack the Ripper. The early crimes, the pre-canonical five murders of Emma Elizabeth Smith and Martha Tabram, are sometimes included in with the, with the Ripper murders and, and sometimes they're excluded. Emma Elizabeth Smith almost certainly wasn't. She appears to have been the victim of a, of a street gang and uh, why she was, she was murdered. 
um, or, or violated so badly that she died from, from the injuries uh, isn't known, but she, was, uh, she, she is unlikely to have been a Ripper victim. Whether or not the murders of Smith, Tabram and Nichols were the work of the same hand, three such gruesome killings in such close proximity, coupled with the local disquiet that the crimes were causing, led to the involvement of officers from the Metropolitan Police's headquarters at Scotland Yard. Their commissioner was Sir Charles Warren, an ex-military man who in the coming weeks would find his competence questioned in the newspapers on an almost daily basis. I don't think Sir Charles Warren was in the least bit incompetent. Uh, he was, and, and it has to be said that when he was appointed to be commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, uh, that the press at the time didn't think he was the wrong man for the job either. It was only as a result of his over violent reaction to the Trafalgar Square riots in 1887 that the press, the radical press in particular, turned against him. On the very day of the Polly Nichols murder, Dr. Robert Anderson had been appointed the new assistant commissioner and head of Scotland Yard's Criminal Investigation Department, or CID. Dr. Robert Anderson, as he was at the time of the crimes, was the head of the CID. He was the assistant commissioner of Scotland Yard and uh, was the man who would have had um, overall charge of, of how the, the, the Ripper crime was investigated. Unfortunately, Robert Anderson came to his post suffering from exhaustion and his doctor ordered that he take an immediate holiday. So no sooner had he taken up office than he left London for Switzerland and in his absence, overall responsibility for the investigation fell to Chief Inspector Donald Sutherland Swanson. As the detective with overall responsibility for the police investigation and for reading and assessing virtually every piece of evidence and information to do with the murders, Swanson would acquire an almost unrivaled knowledge of the case. With three murders now stirring up genuine panic in the neighborhood, Scotland Yard sent in one of its finest detectives, Inspector Frederick George Aberline, a man who knew the East End of London and its underworld intimately. He would become one of the most important of the on-the-ground detectives. Inspector Aberline was uh, a very respected policeman of the day. He was the, uh, a man with a, with a brilliant career in the East End of London who, just before the Ripper murders took place, had been uh, promoted to Scotland Yard. And when the Ripper murders uh, were happening, he was transferred or moved back across to the East End uh, to oversee the investigation on the ground in that area because he knew it so well. <laughs> 